the Lord Jesus Christ said, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Let's worship God together. We sing hymn number 260, 260. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. The psalmist says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. 
our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. And finally, the Lord Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. But the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Let us pray. <clears throat> With many, many others amongst your people, we are conscious, Lord our God, that our own human history condemns us in so many different ways. History itself makes plain our sinfulness and waywardness, our human tendency towards self-assertion and prejudice ensure that peace is so often short-lived. So, Lord, today, as we remember and look back, grant that we who call ourselves by Christ's name may yield our lives to your service, striving always for the understanding and the peace and the reconciliation in all our relationships that you bring by your Spirit. Today, O oh Lord, you look upon the horrors of war. You have seen naked rebellion and disobedience in all its fullness throughout the ages, and so often without the self-sacrifice which many have made. So we confess our sins afresh and pray for our needy, world in all its pain and carnage and bloodshed, for the nations of Ukraine and Iran, for Afghanistan, and today we pray for the 450 or more families who have lost loved ones there in recent years. We remember the battle against ISIS, the political tension in Hong Kong, the countless numbers of victims of murder and hatred, all the individuals so affected and entire nations who are scarred and broken for generations to come. So, God our Father, we pray for a world in need, for those who remember with great pain and with thousands we stand now to remember. Please stand.
They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. The Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to the Tron Church this morning. If you're a visitor today, um, then you're doubly welcome. Um, we hope that you'll feel at home amongst us, and we look forward to the opportunity of a uh, meeting and greeting you after the service. Um, I'd like to ask you to take the opportunity after the service, if you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, just to say hello and to introduce yourself to them. Um, I hope you got a notice sheet uh, when you came in, or you might have found it on your seat. Um, there's just a number of things I'd like to um, point out to you. Firstly, uh, we meet again today, this evening at 6.30 for our evening service, and Edward Lobb will be continuing his series on Judges, so if you're able to come tonight, we'd, we'd love to see you here. On Wednesday evening, um, we have small groups, and they meet either here centrally in the church here, or in different locations around Glasgow at 7.30. Again, if you've not had the opportunity to get involved in a small group so far, I uh, would uh, heartily encourage you to do that. And if you want more information, please contact uh, the church office. You'll see under the Nota Bene section that the women's seminar, which was going to be held this coming Saturday, has been postponed uh, due to necessary uh, building works that are going to be happening on Saturday, and it will be rearranged in due course. And we're really happy today um, to announce the safe arrival of Sophia Rose Baxter, a little daughter to our members, Andy and Naomi. And I think if you keep your eyes peeled at the end of the service, you'll see a photograph on the screen of little Sophia. Um, our senior minister, Willie Phillip, is uh, flying as we speak back from India today. Um, he's been the speaker at the Delhi Bible Institute's Word Conference this year. And so in his absence, we are delighted to have um, our good friend and member of our Council of Reference, the Reverend Peter Dixon from Aberdeen, with us today. And Peter, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Well, let's turn to God's Word together. Our Bible reading this morning is in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to read from chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, reading the whole chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King 
the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Amen. May God help us to receive and understand and respond to His Word. Now let's sing again together words that echo that passage. Hymn number 193, Round the Lord in glory seated flew the choirs of seraphim, filled His temple, and repeated each to each the alternate hymn. 193.
in quiet prayer together, and as we bow and pray, our gifts and offerings for the Lord's work will be received. Let us pray. Still attuned to heaven's glory, yet we face a world of need. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we pause in your presence, we are so conscious of both these things, the glory of heaven and the need of the world, the wonder and the might of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we worship this day with heart and soul and mind and strength. And we do so together with great joy. And yet we live in so broken a world, so full of need, heartache and pain. And there is no fixed gulf between these two things, for you are the God who loves this world, and you sent your Son into this world, this broken world. So our minds and hearts, as we pray together, range far and wide. We pray for those who are indeed desolate and broken and needy in so many ways, spiritually and physically and mentally, and culturally. We're especially con conscious of the thousands in the western part of Africa facing the ongoing crisis of the Ebola virus, and pray for the many who have gone to help, that you would enable them to provide help which is both effective and full of care. We pray that the cycle of the spread of this virus might soon diminish and fade away, that there might be an effective vaccine found, that many lives may be spared. And for those who are grieving and broken, for communities that are torn up and facing the fear and the panic of its effect, come, Lord, we ask, and send your own people full of your Spirit into the midst. We pray, too, for those whose 
greatest need of all is to hear the living words of the gospel brought to them by those whom you send, brought to them through the sound of the living word of Christ himself. We especially remember today the hundreds of pastors who've gathered in Delhi this past week and for the work and ongoing witness and training of the Delhi Bible Institute. We pray your blessing, Lord. May these pastors return to their villages and towns and churches, encouraged and strengthened in their work, equipped to teach and preach faithfully and fruitfully, and especially strengthened, Lord, where they face enmity and hostility, conditions which make life hard and sometimes tortuous, where pastors seek to lead many different little churches, give them strength and energy when they feel their lives are divided into too many loyalties, <clears throat> and continue to provide for them as they learn and as they serve. Thank you, Lord, for Willie and others who've gone out this past week to encourage them and make their time there a blessing to them. We remember others overseas as a church family and as individuals known to us. <clears throat> and we pray for the work that is done in Christ's name where your people serve you today feeling isolated. Remind them of the wonderful family of the living God to which they belong. Where many serve you today and are persecuted, remind them, dear Father, of the presence of your Spirit and the call to battle which we are all meant to obey. where many serve you and are bringing people to see and worship and love the Lord Jesus Christ, provide nurture and safety for young believers in our own families and amongst our own friends. We pray for those who today are far away from us, living elsewhere, and pause to commit them to you, bringing you the burdens of our hearts and our prayers for those whom we love. We also pray for those who are far away from you, who have wandered or seem to be hardened or embittered, who have no perception or understanding or hearing. Come, Lord, we ask, in answer to the prayers that we bring, and by your Holy Spirit, break every human barrier down and provide afresh those who will respond and speak and call. We are sent, we know, to tell a servant's story. So send us with authentic lives of service. Send us, Lord, we pray today, by the teaching of your Word and the gathering together that strengthens us week by week to proclaim that Christ has died and has risen indeed, and make our words authentic by making our lives Christ-like. Throughout this nation, our prayer is that you would provide that kind of Christian witness. Throughout our city, where people serve you in the world of civil authority, where people seek to govern and to lead with integrity. Bless their efforts, we pray. And where leaders have lost sight of your glory filling the earth, where plans and where even intention is to obscure or obliterate the Christian gospel. 
Give your people wisdom, we ask. We think of groups like the Christian Institute and many others serving in this way. Grant that Christian witness might be authentic and real. For churches throughout our land, for churches throughout our city, for fellowships and partnership with us here, for church families facing dramatic and difficult change, new, new chapters in their lives, the beginnings of new vulnerable church plants. Hear our prayers, Heavenly Father, and as we bring our offerings today in whatever fashion we give, we pause to say afresh that we give of all that you have given us. We give in joy and in love and in response that your name might receive glory here and throughout the world. So receive us, hear our prayers, and receive our gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our next song together as we sing is going to be on the screens, the words, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. Let's turn then again to Isaiah chapter 6. The 
Willie Lahore was a farmer's son who grew up near me, and he was about six years older than me. Willie, his friends used to say to him when they had been overtaken by him on his motorbike at about 90 miles an hour, you're going to kill yourself one of these days on that machine. You were so fast the other day, I never even saw you coming up behind me. You're a fool. Local farmers and neighbors and family and friends used to shake their heads and say to one another, how can we get through to him? He was only 19. What's going to make him listen? What's, going to take, what's it going to take to make him see sense and slow down? You try speaking to him, as parents used to say, because I can't get through. I've told him until I'm blue in the face. You may as well speak to the wall. What does it take to get God's Word through to human minds and to touch and change our human hearts? Like all God's people in every generation, we can be so proud and so stubborn and so resistant and suspicious towards the Lord who loves us. We feign deafness and pretend that God's voice is perhaps not as important as we know it is, and so we go on living our Christian lives so often in that way. Now, in the book of Isaiah, God's city, His entire family, had become a denial of all that God stood for. God's people and the very fabric of the city, the fabric of its life, had become a denial of the living God who had rescued His people. His own people had descended into idolatry and into social wickedness. What is evil in the time of Isaiah had become known as what is good, and what is good had become known as evil or worthless. And so the Lord's people had become a topsy-turvy nation and had tipped everything upside down as they consistently and increasingly rejected God's laws, spurned His words, and turned away from His voice. And God in His love for them at the time Isaiah is writing is white hot with righteous anger. So the question is, what could get through to them? What could make them listen or see sense? What is it going to take to bring about a change of heart? And the answer in chapter 6, which as a chapter forms a vital conclusion to Isaiah's introduction to his prophecy, is that the only possibility of the voice of God getting through to these people is that the message from God becomes the messenger of God. So here in chapter 6, we have this intensely personal account from Isaiah himself of what happened to him as he became God's appointed prophet to God's rebellious people. Whenever we read the prophecies in the Old Testament, we're naturally reading them as God's words given to God's people. But of course, we have to deliberately remember that God's words were delivered through God's prophets to God's people. They were delivered through real human beings who, in their own day and generation, had to stand up before real human beings and speak God's words on His behalf. And what God is always doing in this pattern of Old Testament prophecy. Hosea, for example, is another very, very striking example of this. What God is always doing is making His prophets people of absolute integrity in that the words that they speak are 
in line with, or if you like, made flesh in the lives that the prophets live. The words of the prophets are always backed up, sometimes in the most extraordinary way in the Old Testament, the words of the prophets are always backed up by the lives and the circumstances of the prophets' lives. And so the message becomes the messenger, or the messenger becomes, in a living, embodied sense, the message, whichever way around you like to put it. So, in chapter 6, as we are given this insight into Isaiah's experience, we have to realize, and it's somewhat sobering to do so, that Isaiah himself was also under God's wrath and judgment. He was not somehow an outsider. He was part of the whole city that had denied the living God. When good King Uzziah died, he says, Isaiah was that very year when that happened given a vision, a vision of God Himself. When the good king died, because King Uzziah was a good king, the nation had lost its leader. And when the nation lost its good leader, so at that point the nation was then set to go from bad to worse and to even worse. But at that time, Isaiah saw the Lord. We may initially think that such an exciting and spectacular vision gave the prophet an unforgettably wonderful experience. After all, he is given a glimpse of heaven itself. He's given the very thing that so many human hearts long for. He hears the song of the angels as he looks at the seraphs and their wings. This vision is enough to inspire the finest art and music, and the words of that song of the angels are used all these centuries later in countless thousands of Christian services of worship this very day all over the world as the Lord's people worship this same God. But Isaiah's vision for all its glorious splendor and heavenly beauty was not really unforgettably wonderful. It was unforgettably frightening. For the vision was not about giving an Isaiah an experience to excite him. The vision was about giving Isaiah a heart that would prepare him for an unutterably difficult task that would only be humanly possible were he to actually become in his own being and life the very message of God as well as the messenger of God. Here in this stunning vision, as Isaiah encounters the living God himself, what he encounters is, as we were singing, the holiest of all holy beings, he encounters, even in seeing the train, the edge of the robe of God filling the temple, even in that he encounters enough of God's purity for him to see, without even having to pause to think about it, his own sinfulness. This is like a nightmare. Isaiah is like a man who is queuing up to get his CBE and realizing suddenly that he is wearing stinking, filthy rags in the presence of the queen, or a person suddenly realizing that they are standing naked and exposed in a busy department store with hundreds watching. And yet Isaiah was not about to wake up in his bed with a jolt, as we sometimes do, thankful, oh, it was just a dream. For Isaiah, this was not dream of human imagination. This was vision given by God Himself in all its reality. 
And when we human beings begin to see even something of the purity and holiness of Almighty God, we de facto at the same time see something of our own sinfulness for what it really is, and we do not rejoice to be in God's presence when that happens. We automatically want to hide. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden. Verse 5 says it all, doesn't it? Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Of course, it wasn't only Isaiah's lips which were unclean, but with those very lips, he was to speak God's words. And how would he do so when he knows fully well that from his heart, from his sinful heart, and up over his voice box, and out of those lips come all sorts of sinful words. How can I speak God's words, the message from God, if it was going to come from his lips and heart, was going to have to become the messenger of God? if it was to get through to the people in that city. How is it possible to get through, to get the gospel through to a proud man? How is it possible to get the gospel through to somebody who knows me well and has known me all my life? How is it possible to get the gospel through to such a person? Well, it will have to be a man who has been humbled out of his pride who speaks to the proud man. How can you connect with the 19-year-old who drives his motorbike at 90 miles per hour? Well, you go and find another 19-year-old who is a paraplegic following a motorbike accident to speak to him. That's how. How can God get through to people in this world who have thrown His love back in His face? People who have gone running after money of all stupid things instead of the Lord Himself. People who've had an affair with their idols and slapped God in the face repeatedly with their persistent abuse and hatred towards others around them, the very human beings who are made in God's image. How can God ever reach out to a world like ours through people like us? How was God ever going to connect with Israel, such as it was, bad and getting worse, and the good king was dead? Well, he would need a prophet who knew that he was every bit as rotten as the people to whom he spoke. A prophet who would hide himself, given even a glimpse of the glory of God. A man who would never, ever speak with even so much as a hint of personal superiority. And so the chapter goes on to tell us that having come to an end of himself, having been unraveled and despairing before the glory of God's holiness and almost driven out of his own mind by his own sinfulness, what then happens? It's a wonderful thing. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. What happens next? Here is gospel. My wife and I were recently in Cambodia, and we went to visit the only tourist attraction in Cambodia that I know of. Maybe you've been there, Angkor Wat, the world's biggest religious building. My guess is that St. Paul's Cathedral would be about 2% of the size of this place. 
And again and again as we toured around, there were these steep, steep concrete steps, stone steps, going up and up and up and up to a shrine. It was a world of human religion where people thought, as all religious human beings do, that you have to climb up some kind of steep stair to somehow maybe get to the God at the top. If you make it, you might get there. You might please the God who is there in the shrine. What happens next in Isaiah chapter 6? What does the living God do? He takes the initiative. Here is salvation. Here is a world apart from all human religion. God comes down and deals with Isaiah's sin himself. A live coal is brought from the altar, and with its searing heat it is used, if you will, to cauterize his lips, to cleanse those lips that will speak for the Lord from the altar of God's temple, from the shrine, from the high place, comes cleansing for Isaiah. Not a voice saying, climb higher, Isaiah, it's steep. You may make it if you put in more effort. But a coal coming and brought to burn Isaiah's lips he is reassured, your guilt is taken away. Your sin, of which you are so terribly conscious, is atoned for, and then Isaiah is ready to serve. Now he can speak and live as God's prophet with integrity. After this day, would Isaiah ever stand before the people proud of his own achievements? Never. Will Isaiah lord it over the people in that city as spiritually superior? Not even for a moment. Would Isaiah, after this experience, stand up in the temple like a hypocrite, wagging his finger and shaking his fist at sinful Israel? No, because the memory of his indelibly scarred lips would forever and ever remind him that he lives for this God, not because of what he had offered to God by way of gift or brain or stamina or sacrifice, but because this holy God had cleansed him from his sin in his mercy. And so it was that right then and there, at that moment, Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah can say, with his burnt lips, here am I, send me. And God said, go and tell this people. Go, Isaiah, like a paraplegic from your wheelchair, and look them straight in the eyes, and say to them, go on then, Willie, you keep driving like a lunatic. You keep the speed up and keep ignoring the words of the people who love you most. Fine, don't listen to them. And you have it your own way until you end it all like a foolhardy macho who will not believe that your bones will break and your heart could ever stop. And Isaiah, knowing that he must speak with that kind of tone, asks the very next obvious question, doesn't he? Verse 10, if I must preach like this, for how long, O Lord, must I do it? And God says to him, just keep saying it. Keep saying it, Isaiah, until there is no one left in the cities, until you wander the streets like a solitary madman, verses 11 and 12 and 13. Keep 
saying it as you see hundreds and hundreds disappearing off into exile. Keep speaking these words. Keep speaking from your scarred lips until even a tenth of the people are left, and even then the land will be laid to waste. Keep speaking, Isaiah, until the forest becomes a hillside of ragged, raw stumps where there used to be a beautiful woodland, and then, and only then, and eventually, will a holy seed begin to bring a glimmer of hope to this people. So do you and I this morning begin to hear what God is saying to us through Isaiah's experience? Do you begin to see how God can speak effectively in a world like ours, a world which ignores Him and hates Him and would get rid of Him and destroy Him if it could, although it can't, a world which exchanges the love of this God for idols, a world which attacks God's Word and rips it up in His face and flaunts the fact that they do so with the scoffing laughter of a playground bully. Do you see it? If we can see it, this chapter will be our salvation from endless distraction and endless speculation about answering this question, what could possibly make people listen to God's Word? How can we get people to hear the gospel? How can we get Christians who are wandering away from the Lord who loves them reconnect with Christ? How could we ever get a wandering church to come back to its senses? How can we impress on people we love just how serious a thing it is to flaunt God's Word. How can we do that in our families and in our streets and across our desks? Think of John the Baptist in his camel hair clothes and his life of wandering in the desert, the final prophet before the Lord Jesus came. And think of Jesus Himself, the true prophet of God, the ultimate voice. And what was John the Baptist? And what was Jesus? Jesus had no place to lay His head. He sent the religious away with a flea in their ear, but was surrounded by children and sinners and lepers and tax collectors, the lost and the sinful and those He came to reach. the King of kings who made the planets by the very power of His Word and who had ruled the universe from an ageless eternity until He stepped down into this world and then became in His very life a nothing, a no one, and died like a common criminal, the message from God becoming the messenger, and the messenger becoming the message. It's just exactly the same, isn't it, with the twelve apostles in the New Testament who didn't have very much at all between them in worldly terms, certainly not much money, and not much success even as disciples when Jesus was with them. By the time Jesus was dying on the cross, they were all running away from Him and disowning Him publicly. A few months later, did these twelve men stand up in marketplaces and towns across the known world as the gospel began to spread? Did they stand up full of a sense of their own importance, convinced of their own gifting as the Lord's apostles? Did they claim success as they lived each day for the Lord Jesus? No but they knew they were forgiven men. They knew that they had been stood like those stripped naked before the throne of a holy God, wanting to hide in shame. 
They knew that the Lord Jesus Christ had died and had risen, and that was their news and their gospel. And they knew, all twelve of them, that Christ had called them weak, broken, sinful though they be. They knew, utterly and completely they knew, that their guilt had been removed. Isaiah knew that. And their sin had been atoned for. And that is all they ever needed to know. It is the only qualification required to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Willie Lahore died just as everybody said he might, on his motorbike, careering down the same A road at top speed that he passed so many people on before. And he'd heard the warnings over and over and over again, and so there was a day when he heard the warning from somebody for the very last time, and then he died. He would not listen. It's a serious thing to hear God's Word. It's a serious thing to read God's Word. It's serious because the words are the words from the one who loves us perfectly and knows us best. It's serious because God knows what we need to hear. And we are always in this fallen world capable of ignoring Him. It's serious because every single time we hear God's Word, it could quite easily be the last time that a human being hears it. It's serious for any human being to hear God's Word because it's possible to ignore Him for too long and leave the business of listening until it is just too late. It's serious because His love is so great. It's serious because His longing to bring life is born out of the gift of His only Son. It's serious because God has done everything that He ever needs to do in order for His words to get through to us. And so the door is permanently open for people to walk right into His presence. And we human beings would be fools, fools like that 19-year-old not to listen and not to walk through that door. It's serious because we have far, far more than Isaiah's vision from chapter 6. We have far more glory to see than he saw. We have far more insight than he had. We have more than the reality of Isaiah's experience of a long time speaking and being ignored by those who thought they knew better, we have far more to go on. We have far more reason to listen than those who heard Isaiah speak, although they had every reason to listen. Today, human beings have far more reason to listen because we have the full New Testament gospel, and we have the risen Lord Jesus Himself. We do not have a seraph flying, vision-like from heaven, with a coal from the altar to touch our lips. It's often what people want, isn't it? But we have better. We have more. We don't have an angel flying towards us. We have the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself willing can you imagine this? Willing not only to touch our lips, sinful though they are, but to dwell in our hearts and to cleanse somebody like me for good and forever. We have better than a temple to gaze at. We have a cross standing empty and towering over the wrecks of time. We have better than cherubim. We have the saints of Almighty God throughout the world to witness to His glory. 
We have better than all the angelic beings that fill the glory of heaven itself, for we have a knowledge of the redeemed of heaven, some of whom you have known personally, people whose lives have become, in your own experience, so integrated with the message of a crucified Savior that you have known, known even beyond the shadow of a doubt, that this person is a believer of integrity who has become this message incarnated in their life and circumstances. You and I have believers, whether in heaven or on earth, who are, as we say nowadays, the real deal. Believers who have become the message of self-sacrificing, costly love towards us, which is the message of God. You think, you think of the most humble Christian sinner who has had most impact on you, the person who has taught you most, loved you most deeply, forgiven you most for the sake of Jesus Christ. You think of that person, and do you admire them because you know they were sinless, gifted, skilled in some way or another? Do you love their love for Jesus Christ because they have mustered it up out of their own strength and climbed the stone steps up towards the shrine? No, you do not. You love them and thank God for them because they have humbly loved you despite your sin, because they are the person or the people who have always said to you that the only thing they can offer is what Christ has done for them. You love them or remember them because you know that they knew just how weak they are and that Christ is strong. You love them because they do not stand out, but because they are people who enable Jesus to stand out. You love them because they never stand over you, but always alongside you, as Isaiah would have to do. Where there is an Isaiah, there is hope, even if it be distant and seed-like, even if all seems desolate even if the whole world and the whole church seems to have gone mad in its rebellion, where even one lives and speaks, having become in their heart and life the message of God, there is hope. There is gospel seed. And God alone knows how lightweight we are capable of making Him seen in the church in 21st century Western society. But when even one takes him seriously, then there is hope. And so we read Isaiah 6, and we find ourselves like Isaiah, not that we are Old Testament prophets, but like Isaiah, saying, well, Lord, here we are, not just in Your presence, but filled by Your Spirit. Here we are. We find ourselves like Isaiah saying, Search us, Lord, and cleanse us, and send us. And if you are to do that, Lord, once again, as you did with Isaiah, you take the initiative and take it with people like us. And he does. Amen. Let's pray. We rest, O oh God our Father, in the knowledge of the wonder of this gospel. We rejoice together 
and the reality of your patience. We bow before you in wonder, because in your wisdom you are able and willing not only to burn our lips, but to change and alter every circumstance and aspect of our lives, that we might speak to others as those who have been forgiven, those who have known what it is to be cleansed by your Son through His blood. So, Lord, this day, whether we have done so many times or whether we have never, ever done so before, we bow before you, acknowledging that serving you is not about us, not about what we are, but what you do through us, in love for us and in love for those we serve. Hear us, Lord, as we respond in our hearts. Hear us, Lord, as we feed on your word. Hear us, Lord, as we worship you afresh and sing your praise. For your Son died and is risen. And so as we sing to his name, be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hymn number 444, as we close our worship together. Hymn number 444. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Until that day of eternal song, 
by your Spirit's power and through your Son's sacrifice for us, and in your fatherly care and keeping, guard us and keep us until the very end of our lives. For Jesus' name's sake, amen.